let me start off in a uh, rather non-dowsing way here. Uh, many of you had two or three cups of coffee after dinner, so if you feel a need, if I get long-winded and you feel a need to uh, depart the room briefly, uh, just feel free. It does not disturb me at all if people get up and move around and just be comfortable. <clears throat> if I, uh, if my coffee kicks in, we'll probably have a five minute break, so. It's been a busy day. Uh, I would like to start with a little relaxation, if that works for you guys. <clears throat> Let's take about uh, a minute and a half here. Find yourself a comfortable position. You can close your eyes or leave your eyes open, whatever works best for you. And let's just start by doing a little breathing. Two or three very slow, deep breaths. And it helps sometimes to actually tell your body to relax. <clears throat> Move your head around on your neck. Let your neck relax a little bit. Move your jaw, loosen your jaw, and let it go left to right. Here's a good one. Relax your eyelids. As you get very relaxed, you can begin to feel the circulation in your body, particularly in your scalp and your face. You might feel a little tingling of circulation. <clears throat> you might tell yourself, I release the energy of the day. I am relaxed. I am alert. I am focused. Now just for a moment, speak to your guidance whatever form you are aware of your guidance, <clears throat> guardian angels or helpers, friends, angels, any way that you relate to guidance and invite them to be with you this evening. Many of you came this weekend feeling a need for healing of some type. Physical healing, emotional healing, psychological healing. Quite often if we forget about the healing that we need and focus on healing others, then we receive as we give. <clears throat> we always have miraculous healings. <clears throat> they always occur at gatherings like this. They will occur this weekend.
Take one more deep breath. Open your eyes. Be alert, focused, totally receptive to whatever comes your way this evening. Mm. You feel good. <laughs> Boy. <clears throat> We're all intuitive beings. The intuition does not work through the use of words. It works through direct insight. So when there are moments of silence this evening, allow them, relax with them, and in retrospect later, you will be aware of what you heard, of what you received. <clears throat> this is a new, uh, new chair for me. I usually sit on a bar stool when I'm speaking. Don't read anything into that. Just <clears throat> but this is very comfortable. So if I doze off, you guys will let me know. Right? I speak slowly, I walk slowly, I live slowly. So I hope that's uh, comfortable for you. I usually begin by suggesting that everybody create in your mind a mental shelf, a place to store things. I'm going to First of all, I'm not going to say anything that you don't already know, but I will say it in different words so that perhaps you will find yourself saying, oh yeah, I knew that. We want to bring to the surface the great wisdom that sits within us. We are all fully aware of the path we have followed, of the time, the hours, the days, the weeks, the months, the years we have sent, spent going to workshops, reading books, going to support groups, and yet we're still here. So we want to take a rather large step now, your mental shelf is a place to put ideas and concepts that you're not quite sure about. We're trained as Westerners in this world that it is up to us to always be right. We have to be right. We have to win the argument. We have to be the one that knows the most. And you've come far enough down your path to know that that is total nonsense. Intuition does not know about right and wrong. Ego knows about right and wrong. We're going to park our egos at the door. Okay? Now, we don't want to get rid of egos. Egos can be very helpful. They can get you across the street in traffic. That's very useful. But as Ram Dass says, the ego makes a great servant and a lousy master. So, egos have trained us as to how we should behave, how we should be, who we should be, where our self-worth comes from what's valuable to us, what we should seek, what we should not seek, how we relate to other people, all that's ego nonsense. So it takes us a while when we hear something new, or not new, nothing will be new, but hear it said in a new way, it takes us a while, takes our ego a while to get out of the way. 
The ego immediately wants to judge it. That's right or that's wrong. The ego does not think about it a while and say, let me see how that feels. Let me douse and see if that's right or wrong. Let me douse and see if that has any value for me. Maybe it has some value and some things that I don't need. Many, many options. We have the tools, we have the know-how to inquire of our guidance through dowsing or whatever your technique is. Is this useful for me? Is this something I should look at more? Okay. So I'm going to say things, hopefully in a really far out weird way. Okay. And you will have the opportunity to say that's nonsense or that's true, or put it on the mental shelf and say, I'll think about that tomorrow. It'll make more sense to me tomorrow, whatever. Put it on the mental shelf. If our life is not perfect the way it is right now, if you can think of any way in which your life could be improved, that means your belief system needs modification. Our egos are trained. We do not modify our belief system. We defend our belief system. So, the mental shelf comes in real handy. Don't have to modify it right now. Don't have to defend it right now. Just put it up on the mental shelf and say, well, maybe that'll be valuable to me at a later time. So I will say things intentionally that may cause you to think, is that right? Is that wrong? Is that valuable? Is that meaningless? And you can simply not feel pressured to know whether it's right or wrong right off the bat. Okay? So if I were to say, everything is okay just the way it is. <laughs> Everybody came up with 20 things that are wrong, that are not okay the way they are. That's the way our mind works, right? But perhaps we can come around to a belief system that says everything is okay just the way it is. This might be a good place for me to talk about the meanings of words. Words are really silly ways to communicate. Words are symbols of symbols of representations of something. Telepathy is the way to communicate. If you communicate with telepathy, which your intuition is telepathy, then you get the big picture, then you get the whole image. You not only get the word and the thought and the meaning and the insight, but you see it in the big context, the whole thing. <clears throat> so we have trouble with words. Now, I heard somebody today use the word God. Now, if I were to ask for a show of hands, which I won't, there would be some people in here who say, I don't believe in God. And actually, I have members of my extended family, extremely intelligent people, who do not believe in God. And that's totally logical to me. I completely understand how somebody can look out on this world and see leukemia and war and poverty and starvation and pollution and greed and anger and say, a loving God would never allow that. Therefore, there can't be God. So, I rarely use the word God. I use the word source or creator or universe. Universe is one of my favorite words for God. I would suggest, as a very useful tool, we react when we hear people use words that we don't like, words that don't sit well with us. We go into reactive mode. And we don't need reactive mode anymore. Reactive mode is for insecure egos. 
who need to defend something. Okay? We don't ever need to defend anything again as long as we live. So, let's redefine a lot of words. If you define the word, nobody else's definition, not a definition you got when you were growing up, not a definition you got from a school teacher or from a church or from some educational institution, but it's your definition. You're in charge of what words mean to you. You've given words all the meaning they have to you. So let's shift some. Think about, if I were to say God, how you would interpret that now. You know, would you say the source of all? Sometimes I define God as the isness that is the allness. I kind of like that one. God certainly has no personality. God certainly can't get angry at anybody. God certainly cannot judge anybody. And God, to me, is love. So if I look out on the world and I see all the tragedy and I say God can't be love, I need to redefine some things. Okay? So, many words that we want to be comfortable with because there are words, our definitions of words. So, God. So, heaven. What's heaven? You know, to me, well, I'll start making use of your mental shelf. <laughs> right off the bat here. Um, nothing exists outside of your mind. Nothing exists. We're always reacting to what's out there, and there is no out there. Out there does not exist. You have never experienced anything anywhere else than in your mind. You experience joy in your mind, pain in your mind, Bliss in your mind, anger in your mind, confusion in your mind, tragedy is in your mind. If it weren't all in your mind, there would be no difference between whether you were blind or had eyesight. You see something out there and it upsets you. If your eyes were closed or you had no eyesight, it would not upset you. Until somebody said, well, it upsets me and you're supposed to feel like I feel, so let me tell you how bad it is. Right? We love to share how bad things are. What if thoughts create reality? Well, let me just go into ego here just for a minute. I define everything for myself. So I define ego as the part of us that believes we are separate from everything. That's our life. That's how we spend our day, believing we are interacting with separate beings. We were raised that we had to take care of ourselves, that we were responsible for our well-being that if you wanted to get anywhere in this world, you had to work hard. Now, I sometimes, I like master teachers. I find master teachers to be good role models. Now, how many master teachers could you name right now? Or awakened uh, individuals, or whatever term you use for that sort of thing. We all speak about Jesus as being an awakened master, Buddha, Lao Tzu, Confucius. There are many, there have been many. If I were to tell you right now, <clears throat> there are well over 10,000 fully enlightened, walk on water, raise the dead, master teachers on this planet in this instant. 
Would you have to put that on the mental shelf? It's true. It's very true. How many will there be, be on this earth 50 years from now? Well into the millions. Well into the millions. Every one of you understand what the shift is. Now, I probably say it my way, and, but you've been describing it as we go along. The veil is thin, was said up here tonight. The shift is occurring. Life is not what it used to be. Life will never be what it used to be. Let me ask some questions. This is a good place to start. Let me ask some questions. And if you just play a little mental game with me, just you can answer the question to your neighbor sitting there or you're just in your head, whatever. But let me ask you some questions. Who are you? Oh, you guys are good. <laughs> I was ready to say, no, you're not a man or a woman. You're not Bob or Joe or Sue. But you already picked up on that one. What words did you use to describe yourself? Some words. Love. Spirit. I am. Absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. Let me ask you what your limitations are. What do you perceive there to be that you cannot accomplish between now and the end of this physical life? Oh, you guys... You can take my game away from me. There had to be 200 nothings said. Now you want to take this out on the street with you tomorrow, right? It's not just for when you're sitting here. You want to take this with you as you go out. What is the purpose of your life? What is your mission in life? Heal the earth. All right, let me make another suggestion here, which perhaps you might want to use your mental shelf for. We'll see. Your mission we tend to look at our mission by looking back on before I incarnated, when I was writing up my contract for this life, what did I put in there? Well, I wanted to heal the earth. I wanted to assist Gaia. We all had that in there somewhere. It was major or minor, but it was in there somewhere. We wanted to bring planet earth and its inhabitants through this shift into the golden age. Why is the title of this Convention, the Golden Age. The Golden Age is not what people on this planet experienced a few hundred years ago or a thousand years ago. That was total unpleasantness. Okay? Winston Churchill said, history he defined history as one damn thing after another. <laughs> Read history books. Why would anybody enroll in this planet? Why would anybody come here? You would have to be really off balance to say, I want to go to that planet. Murder, disease, starvation, hunger, struggle, pain at every turn. Why would anybody come here? Hmm. 
I, I refer to Earth as Earth School. It's a school. And long, long ago, when I discovered that I had unseen helpers and friends that I could ask questions of, I asked that question. I said, why would anybody come to this planet? I mean, were we really thinking about what we were doing when we said, yeah, I'll take a life down there? Or we, were we just insane? And my guide said, let me show you something. And he took me on a tour, a tour of this universe and many other universes. And he showed me what he referred to as graduates of planet Earth. Sometimes I can't talk when I review some of the things I've seen, but the graduates of planet Earth are so pure light, pure love, totally empowered, can never get trapped in anything again, never experience struggle, pain, doubt, confusion again. They create universes in the snap of a finger. They create the Big Bang at any moment they want to. It took me about three seconds of looking at graduates of planet Earth to say, I'll do that. That's for me. I don't care what I have to go through. If I come out like that, that's what I want. That's what you're here for, and that's where you're going. You have no choice about the matter. You can try to prevent your graduation from Earth School by focusing on things that bother you, things that you see that are wrong, but it won't work. You're going to graduate anyway. There is nothing wrong on planet Earth. It's school. You all raised somebody, and they went to school, and they came home, and they told you how mean the teachers were. They made you take an arithmetic test. I had to take an English test. It was horrible. It's very, very, very difficult. We're not trivializing pain and struggle. We're not minimizing it when we say it's a bad dream. It is a bad dream. The only way that there can be a creator, a source, an isness that is the allness, that is love, is if the tragedy that we see is not real. If it's real, there is no God. There is no God if it's real. If there are victims on this planet, there is no God. Now, immediately, the battle inside of us, which is described in all the great teachings, the Bhagavad Gita is the whole story of the bad battle inside of us, right? I need to believe, and I need to have causes, and I need to be against everything that is wrong out there. When I say I came to heal the earth, I think, huh? I got to find what's wrong with the earth. I got to search it all out. I got to find out everything that is incorrect. And I got to rally the troops together and let's straighten it out. Is that what any master teacher told you to do? Any master teacher, anyone who was awakened, did any of them say anything like that to you? Can you imagine 
a fully awakened, enlightened, walk on water, raise the dead, master teacher saying, resist not evil. We want to tell that master teacher, you're not compassionate. Hmm. What if, just a what if, consciousness creates reality? Hard work doesn't create reality. Stress doesn't create reality. No virtue in stress at all. Getting plaques from people when you die and they come and they say he was a good person. He worked 18 hours a day. What a, what a hero. What did that do for the planet? What did that do for you? You have one job. Now you came with a mission. It's true. You could write that mission down right now. You could say, I am here to assist Gaia. I am here to help the underprivileged. I am here too. And you could have a long list and that's all true and that's all wonderful. That is the way that you placate your own karma. That's for healing you. You don't heal Mother Earth for Mother Earth's sake. You heal Mother Earth for your sake. Because you are the one who damaged her. You're merely forgiving yourself for what you thought you did, which you didn't really do. Whoa, is the mental shelf overflowing? <laughs> you know this already. If there is a creator who in any way resembles love, Nothing is wrong on planet Earth. A well-designed school to get us to the point where we can forgive ourselves for what we did a thousand years ago, 10,000 years ago, a hundred thousand years ago, a million years ago. We simply want to forgive ourselves. So your mission, regardless of what you wrote down on the yellow pad, which you probably filled up two or three yellow pads, all the things that needed a little help here, your mission is to heal yourself. Once you heal yourself, you will not even need to think about healing another person. When they walk into your presence, they will be healed. You won't even need to think about healing situations that look unfair. If you think about the situation, it will be healed. We want to do things the way that the brightest, the most advanced, the most enlightened beings on the planet have done them. And none of them resisted evil. Now, uh, things can stay on your mental shelf for weeks or months, that's all right. You don't have to come to some conclusion about whether that's right or that's wrong yet. Okay. Let me offer an example. Many of you believe in reincarnation, I would suspect. Now, reincarnation is not possible. Reincarnation means there must be time. Born, die, born again, die, some timeline we follow. And we know today time is an illusion. We know today quantum physics. I have a degree in physics, so I like quantum physics. Quantum physics tells us that there are multiple dimensions of reality. There are parallel realities. Quantum physics has only found 11 dimensions of reality. We think we're in third dimensional time space, but quantum physics has found 11. 
And we know that there's an infinite number of dimensions of reality. We know that, well, a little story I got from my guides again when I asked them about time. My, I have a guide who's kind of my uh, MC, I guess. He's my tour guide or something. He brings people in to tell me stuff. He brought a fellow in and, and the fellow said, I am from the fourth dimension. Let me tell you what time is to me. Okay. He said, in the fourth dimension, which you will enter the instant that you leave that body, you may jump to fifth or sixth, but you'll pass through fourth dimensional reality. He said, you see in three dimensional time, time as a straight line. You say the past is over here, the future is over here, I'm right here on the line, right? If I made a mistake back here, there's nothing I can do about it. It's gone. I'm guilty forever. All I can do is have regrets. I can look at the future and say, boy, I hope things work out. I hope I don't get more of what I had last year. You know? No control over future, no control over past. Okay? That's why all the spiritual teachers tell us to live in the now. Live in the now moment. He said... When we're out of body and we decide to take another body, we want to incarnate on planet Earth. That means we're going to drop back down into three-dimensional time space. He said, we can look at time not as a straight line, but we look at time as a circle. Okay? And as a circle, I can examine the circle of all time and say, I think I'll incarnate there. Or here. I think I'll incarnate in the year 2300. I think I'll incarnate in the year 1561. I think I'll incarnate in the year 865 BC. We're not limited as to where on the timeline we enter a life. We can live all of our future lives before we live our past lives. Kind of messes up our ideas of reincarnation, right? <laughs> just, just remember we don't know anything. The wisest people know they know nothing. We don't have in three-dimensional time space, we have no reference points to understand what takes place in fifth dimensional reality or 80th dimensional reality or infinite dimensionals of reality. We don't know anything. We would be real smart not to run our own lives. You can't even see tomorrow. How are you going to make a decision about what to do tomorrow? Boy, that'd be silly, wouldn't it? Tomorrow, should I... Or should I? That's the only way to do it. Somebody knows more about tomorrow than you do, and if you give power of attorney to them to control your tomorrow and next day and next day and next day, you're going to have a much nicer life. You're not going to run into near as many brick walls. You don't even know if the hurricane's going to hit tomorrow or an earthquake, or a whatever, right? Let's let somebody else decide all that. My guide then brought in a fellow who said, I'm from fifth dimensional reality. You guys in third dimensional time space think that time is a straight line. Past, future, now, can't do anything about past, it's gone. Fourth dimensional guides say, would say, well, just relive it. <laughs> do it again. <laughs> he can step back onto that circle anywhere he wants. So he can do anything about anything in terms of time. Just fourth dimension. Right? The fifth dimensional guy said, now in fourth dimensional they see it as a circle. They have more control over time than you do. They can step on the line here or here or here or here. Oh, by the way, they can go backwards in time. They don't have to go forwards. It's not a one-way street. It's a two-way street. They can go that way or that way. Live your life from end to beginning. That's pretty cool. Wouldn't you like to get younger every day? That's pretty nice. Okay. The fifth dimensional guy says, 
We don't see time as a straight line. We don't see it as a circle. To us, all time is a dot. All time is simultaneous time. And he said, if you believe in three-dimensional time-space version of time, forgiveness has no meaning whatsoever. What that person did, they did, and they're wrong. He said, in fifth-dimensional time-space, if we think a loving thought right now, we transformed all time, past, present, and future, into love. I'll take that one. I like that one. No regrets of the past, no fears of the future. I'll think a loving thought right now, and I just transformed all time, past, present, and future, into love. Wow. Cool stuff. What a deal. And then my guide said, here's a fellow from sixth dimensional time space. And he came in and he said, no, there's none of that straight line stuff here. There's none of that circle stuff here. Fifth dimensional, that's a way far ahead of third or fourth because if time is simultaneous, we can change everything by any thought we think right now. But he said to, in the sixth dimensional, all time is no time. At which point I said, I think I'll quit here. <laughs> I have no shot at understanding that. I can understand the metaphors for fourth and fifth dimensional, but that doesn't mean I can understand what it would be like to live in that situation. We don't know anything, right? Okay, now, in order to bring a little bit of perhaps there's a better way of looking at life than I've been using into our thought process, let me go back to something that now we know doesn't exist, and that's linear time and linear time reincarnation. Live, die, live, die. You know, karma, what'd you do wrong? Well, you gotta pay that debt here. You know, none of that exists, none of that's real, but it's a useful metaphor for people who are not awake. 99% of the people on the planet are not awake. So if you want to improve their life, what would you say to them? Do unto others. Do unto others, because it's going to come back and get you, whatever you do, okay? Do unto others. Ten Commandments, right? Those are for people who do not quite understand it. The Ten Commandments were written in Aramaic, and in Aramaic they have a completely different meaning than we give them today. Thou shalt not kill in Aramaic means you cannot kill. Nothing can die, nothing can be killed, everything is infinite. You've lived forever, you will live forever. You are infinite beings. You cannot steal. Stealing implies there's an object out there that is not part of me, separate from me. And I'm gonna take it from you, who are separate from me. There's only one. The object is me, you are me, we are one. Now use whatever analogy or metaphor you need to inch your way toward these things. I don't get that you and I are one. I, I, I just haven't been able to grab that. But I can grasp the idea that we're in telepathic communication. I've seen telepathy work thousands of times. Okay, so I can say we got the same mind. Okay, not the same belief system. No two people in here have the same belief system. Your belief system is unique to you. But somewhere we are one. And we're moving towards that. Now oneness, if there's only one, that does not ex exclude anything. That does not exclude God, God, very God, most high. So you must be God, God, very God, most high. 
That's not blasphemy. That's just waking up to the truth. That's just the way it is. Deem yourself worthy of Christ consciousness. Deem yourself worthy of that. Now, we all have causes. We all go after the bad stuff. We all want to rally the troops and defeat this and defeat that. From a reincarnational perspective, think about who you sympathize with, who you are compassionate with, who you try to help, who you try to heal, the downtrodden, the victims, right? Those are the folks we think we want to help. Who are we against? The victimizers, the greedy, right? The ones who seek power over other people. Those are the ones that we don't like. If reincarnation is real, look at who you've been being compassionate with. The victimizer, the abuser, the thief, the murderer, the whatever in this life that we all rally against in the next life is the victim, is the one that's being abused. And we run to their aid. You're being abused. Let me help you. Do you realize you were helping the abuser? Same soul, different life. It is in our nature. It is deep in our nature to not judge the abuser or the abused, but to simply be compassionate. If you are me, no matter what appearance you have right now in the world, if you are me, I certainly hope I'm compassionate to you because I want to be compassionate to me. Okay, bigger mental shelf, stretch it out, a little more room. And you know you already know all this. Hmm. Nothing on planet Earth is what it appears to be. Now, what does that do to your self-worth, to your self-image? We get our self-worth and our self-image from knowing what's right and what's wrong, what's good and what's bad, from judging everything. That's where our self-worth comes from, from being right, from knowing more than the next person, having the answer to the question. When the master teachers say, hey, I myself can do nothing. It is the Father within who does everything. I don't know anything. I don't know how to do anything. I don't know anything. I'm just a Jesus. I don't know anything. Your favorite master teacher, what did they oppose? What did they do when somebody came to them for healing? Hmm. You remember, I think it's in uh, Mark chapter 6, verse 27, where somebody came to Jesus for a healing and Jesus said, Ooh, this is going to be a tough one. <laughs> How do healers heal? Well, Jesus, of course, studied Reiki. <laughs> you don't need to take one more workshop, go to one more class, read one more book. Just remember who you are. Remember who you are. You are God, God, very God, most high, and there is nothing, 
that you cannot accomplish or do in this very lifetime. And we couldn't have said that a thousand years ago. It was not the golden age. This is the golden age. We're on the cusp. You can call it the Aquarian age if you want. Comes around every 26,000 years. I refer to it as graduation time. It happens every 26,000 years. Millions of people graduate from planet Earth. They get it. They wake up. They stop resisting evil. They start holding love in mind. If you hold love in mind, that's all you need to be the greatest healer you've ever known. All great healers healed by not believing there was anything wrong with the person who came to them asking for healing. John of God, great story. Healed Wayne Dyer. He told the whole story on PBS television. John of God never asked him what was wrong. Just said, yeah, we can do that. Wayne Dyer said, I'm not a believer, I'm sorry. You know, I, I don't have time to fly down to Brazil or wherever he is, South America somewhere. So you don't need to come down. There is no distance, there is no time, there is no space. We're all one, we're all in the same place at the same time regardless. Wayne Dyer was a little skeptical. Said, okay, go ahead and do it. He was told that he had had surgery. He said, I don't see anything. You did surgery on me? Yep, was a success. It's good, you're, you're good. Now, he, he was also told, you need to recover from your surgery. I don't see any incisions. I don't have any stitches in my body. He got up, said, I'm going to go for my jog. <laughs> Into the driveway, he collapsed. Carried him back, put him in bed. Three weeks later, he was able to sit up. No more leukemia. Doctor's diagnosis of terminal, gone. Doctors don't talk about healing. They talk about remission. To heal, know that nothing is wrong. To heal, know that nothing is wrong. To heal another human body, know that nothing is wrong with that body. It's created in the divine image. It's still in the divine image. It's perfect. To heal a situation, oh, well, I better analyze that situation and see how many people are causing trouble here and who needs to go and, ah, oh, sorry. To heal a situation, know that it is healed. Takes away a lot of your life. You spend your life resisting so many things. You know, what are you going to do with all that time? If I had to know anything, I would not be sitting up here. I never know what I'm going to say when I come in front of a group. Sometimes what I say to me makes no sense. Sometimes it does make sense. I don't know. I have no idea. But let it be the way it is. Make peace with what is. That's the only way you can stop resisting what is. When you resist what is, it continues. I was teaching a class many, many years ago at a Unity, Unity Church. And I gave one of the worst talks I've ever given, I thought. 
nothing would come to me. I would say something and it seemed disjointed and irrelevant and I didn't know why I was saying what I was saying. I did a 40 minute class and I got up and said to my friend, that was the most discombobulated talk I ever gave in my life. The next Sunday, I did the class and a woman came up after the class and said, I was here last week, last Sunday. I said, Saturday before last Sunday, I was going to kill myself. A voice in my head said, that's all right, but please go to church first. Our church was the closest one to her house, so she chose that one. Came and sat in on my class. I remember her face, so I can't speak <laughs> to, I get uh, beclimped, what do they say? Uh, she said, last Sunday, you told the story of my life. and you told it in a different light, and I could see that it was okay for me to go on. Let the Spirit use you. Don't worry about whether what you say is right or wrong, true or false, good or bad. Your intent is to get home to be one of those graduates of planet Earth. And along the way, you will be a fantastic healer. You cannot avoid it, and you don't have to study Reiki. <laughs> Unless it's your bliss. You follow your bliss. If it's your bliss, you do it that way. It's your, your bliss is two things. If you follow your bliss, you are A, doing what you are capable of doing to be the greatest service because of your history. That's what I learned, I know that, that's my thing, I can do that. So you have talent that came from you don't know where, 100,000 years ago. It's also your karma. You follow your bliss because it heals what you think you did wrong somewhere back there. Okay. Follow your bliss, yes. But don't believe that if your bliss is Reiki, that it's the Reiki that's doing the healing. It's spirit. Hmm. Hmm. You will never again think that you got an answer by dowsing. Who moves the pendulum? Oh, it's my muscles moving. Who moved your muscles? Who told you to pick up the pendulum? You think your thoughts are your own. You don't know what you're going to be thinking five minutes from now, so there's no way you can think those thoughts. You don't choose your thoughts. You choose your consciousness. I choose love, I choose peace, I choose harmony, which attracts thoughts. We're not smart enough to think our own thoughts. We don't know anything. How would we know what to think next? Hmm. Well, if you leave here with only one thing, I hope it is, I don't know anything. <laughs> A little bit of what I see coming down the road. We all want to live in the future because we're not comfortable with the present. It's the only reason we want to go to the future, because we're not comfortable with the present. So a little bit about the future.
you have to let your belief system believe that there will be no such thing as life as usual. We're, we're educated. You know, in the West, we're told education is everything, and education is all about history, and history is the way it is, one damn thing after another. History repeats itself, we are told. No longer true. No longer true. Let's say you could create a worldview. Now, if, I were, if, if somebody from outer space came and they, they said, hey, you're from Earth, tell us what life on Earth is like. You'd give them the worldview. It's disease, it's poverty, it's pain, it's struggle. It's hard. If you could create a worldview, if you could create a future on planet Earth to be anything you want it to be, and immediately we say, well, this is a nice fantasy, but it doesn't work that way. It works that way now. I'm sorry, you're in the golden age. If consciousness creates reality, you want to hold in mind what you want the Earth to be. If you want Gaia to be healed, you're going to picture what it's like to have a healed Gaia around you all the time. One message I got, my tour guide introduced me to Gaia, and Gaia said, don't worry about me. First of all, having people here is my service, and I'm on a path of service just like you are. And secondly, if I didn't want you here, I'd shrug my shoulders and you'd all be gone. <laughs> Gaia is not in trouble. Gaia is not a wimp, a weakling who can't defend herself, take care of herself, heal herself. Gaia is a pretty much, but not totally, enlightened being. Your job in relation to Gaia is to enjoy each other. Gaia enjoys having you here. You enjoy being with Gaia. If Gaia needs something, don't see what Gaia needs. Don't look for the problem. Don't see anything wrong. Be love, and Gaia will be healed. Love heals. Love heals. Love heals. Love heals. Heals, love heals, love heals. Did I say love heals? <laughs> Being aware of a problem creates more problems just like it. Consciousness creates reality. Stop seeing anything wrong and very shortly there will be nothing wrong in your life. Now, it's dangerous. I want to warn you that when you get this way, people will flock to your door wanting what you have. I had to drop off of Facebook. Long ago, one more story. When I got out of college, I went to work for an airline as an engineer. A friend that I worked with brought me a copy of Be Here Now. Some of you are familiar with that from Ram Dass. And I read that book and I thought, Boy, that's it. That's the answers. And at the same time, my life got really, 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 really good. I was the fleet leader for a fleet of aircraft. For five months, my life got so good, I never did a bit of work. I went to work and talked metaphysics with people. 
my ex-wife said, I was even a nice person to live with for those five months. <laughs> that was quite a compliment. Everything went well, no problems with anything. My ancient antique car ran perfectly. Life was just smooth and great. I thought, all you got to do is read Ram Dass's book and you're home free. <laughs> you know that's not the ending, yeah. <clears throat> My secretary, with whom I talked metaphysics, began to notice certain things. And she would bring people to sit beside my desk. And what are you here for? She told me to sit here. Oh, okay. I went up, I said, Peggy, why do you keep bringing people to sit by my desk? And she said, none of your business. <laughs> And this went on for a long time. <laughs> and I finally cornered her. I said, Peggy, you have to tell me what you are doing. I don't even know these people. You're bringing them up and putting them in the chair by my desk. <laughs> she said, OK. She said, Bob sat by your desk yesterday. When he came in the room, he had a terrible cold. When he left, he had no cold. said, last Tuesday, Sally came up and sat by your desk for 15 minutes. This morning, she had a doctor's appointment. Doctor said, no more sign of the cancer, it's gone. Day after day, this went on. It had absolutely nothing to do with me. I didn't know why she was bringing these people here. I didn't know what was happening to them. I had nothing to do with it. Dreams have always been a very significant part of my communication with spirit. I had a dream after five months of that going on in which I was told, <clears throat> you have not been doing any of this. We have been doing this on your behalf. We have been showing you what it is possible for you to attain in this lifetime. Your job is to attain it. And then, one of the worst messages I ever got, my guide said, we're going on vacation, you're on your own. <laughs> And you know what happened. My life fell apart in every way it could fall apart. I lost my marriage. I started a new business. It went bankrupt. Everything went wrong in my life. One night at 2 a.m., I was sitting on my sofa in my house that the bank now had repossessed. And I said, if there's anybody out there is it okay if I kill myself? <laughs> and I was quite serious. Twice in my life, I've heard an audible message from spirit. Usually it's in my head, but twice I've heard the words as if somebody was standing right next to me. And I got one of the worst messages I've ever gotten. It said, not allowed. Wow, now there is no way out. <laughs> I'm backed in a corner, beaten about the head and shoulders, driven to my knees, and I'm not allowed to kill myself? Well, spirit acts pretty fast when you get the message. I got the message, I am not in control. My ego can create nothing I want. Nothing in this world is going to satisfy me. The only thing I'm after is enlightenment. 
Two o'clock in the morning, I got that message from Spirit. 6 a.m. in the morning, my phone rings. It's Carol Parrish, a spiritual teacher who lived near me, and she said, Spirit just told me to call you and give you a scholarship to our retreat, which begins this morning. I had no money. I had no money. I had $3 the day before, but when I was mailing a letter, a woman came up to me and said, can you give me some money for a sandwich? She hadn't been drinking. She was clear-eyed. And I said, I'm sorry, but I only have $3 left to my name. And she walked off. Then I came to my senses. What am I doing? I had to chase her for three blocks <laughs> to catch her and give her my last $3. I had no money, but I had enough gas in my car to get to this retreat, which was held on a lake, beautiful setting. I walked in the lodge. I thought, I'll just sleep in my car. You know, maybe somebody will buy me a hamburger. I walked in the lodge, the public address came on <clears throat> and said, Paxton Roby, please come to the front desk. Nobody knew I was there. I had just walked in the door. I went to the front desk. The clerk said, here's your key. Somebody has paid for your room and board for the weekend. Well, there is nothing spirit cannot do when we get the message. Get the message. And spirit will perform miracles for you right and left. That's the natural state of being. It's nothing special. It's normal. It's natural. Miracles are natural. When miracles do not occur, something has gone wrong. Hmm. Well, we don't know anything. We have no clue who we are. Nothing on planet Earth is what it appears to be. The only thing you want, you certainly do not want to fix anything. Fixing things creates more problems. big difference between fixing and healing. Fixing requires you to see what's wrong. Healing requires you to be in a state of love. Consciousness creates reality. Thoughts create reality. Love everybody. Serve everybody. You are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. Shalom.